afternoon we're going to be looking at some uh, new uh, technology aspects, some uh, new developments in, in uh, future technology. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be joined by uh, an excellent panel of speakers. So we're going to be kicking off um, with Gary Powell, who's technical manager at Bridgestone. Um, his biography uh, quite modestly says his entire knowledge is second to none. So we're expecting a cracking presentation, but as it should be after 31 years in the industry. So uh, yeah, Gary's going to tell us a bit more about an environmentally friendly future uh, that delivers dividends for all in the world of tyres. So Gary, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just to say, my name is Gary Powell and I'm the technical manager for Bridgestone. Uh, my present presentation today is called An Environmentally Friendly Future that delivers dividends for all. Okay, Earth is currently facing a lot of environmental concerns. Environmental problems like climate change, resource depletion, loss of biodiversity, and much more that affects every human, animal, and nation on this planet. Over the last number of decades, more and more business have become more environmentally aware. This is because not only do green initiatives save on costs, reuse resources and meet compliance requirements, but they also help to create a strong brand loyalty amongst their customers seeking similar ambitions and goals. Besides lowering the consumption of energy, Bridgestone technology adoption and investment in R&D have supported ever improving environmentally friendly tyre products as well as internal manufacturing processes. We in Bridgestone are committed to continually walk towards a sustainable society with integrity and in unity with our customers, partners, communities, and the world around us to help ensure a healthy environment for current and future generations. We have three important commitments. Reduce CO2 emissions, value natural resources and be in harmony with nature. In today's presentation, we should cover all three commitments. However, before we look in detail at these three goals, I'd just like to highlight a few key points on Bridgestone. Since its foundation in Tokyo in 1931, the company philosophy has been to serve society with superior quality. This mantra has served the business well as Bridgestone is now the world's largest tyre company employing 150,000 staff that design, develop, test, manuf manufacture and support high quality tyres for all types across the globe. Okay, let's review those three commitments one by one. Reduce CO2 emissions. Often businesses or individuals have to make a choice between the lowest cost and the lowest environmental impact. The good news with many of the latest generation products, these are aligned and choosing the best environmental policy can also give the lowest cost with this in mind, we often talk about our low rolling resistance products for highway use. But it should also be noted that all our new products are developed with low rolling resistance capability. If you take our new regional product, Duravis R002, we see not only a fuel efficient, robust, high mileage product, but a product that delivers savings, but more importantly, reducing CO2 emissions for customers that decide to fit this state-of-the-art product. It should be noted that tyre labelling was introduced in 2012 and identifies noise, wet grip and relevant for CO2 reduction, rolling resistance. The rolling resistance is graded from A as best to E as poorest. But how many people really understand what the label grade translates to when applied to a vehicle. Let's run through an example. We will use a very common UK vehicle configuration, a six by two tractor unit on 315 70 22.5 by, 22 
by far the most common size on a Euro 6 truck pulling a triaxle semi trailer on 385 65 22.5. Application is UK regional distribution from hub to single drop and empty returns that runs 200,000 kilometres. If the truck is currently achieving 10 miles per gallon, fuel is one pound a litre and it's running on tyres that all have D fuel rating, the annual fuel cost will be around £56,500. If we then change to C rated tyres and keep everything the same, the annual cost will be £54,076. If we then change to B rated tyres, the annual fuel cost will be £51,657 with an actual fuel saving near £5,000. So moving to low rolling resistance regional tyres like Duravis R002 can save you money on fuel, assuming you measure this alongside driver performance and tyre pressure maintenance. This is totally different to just a few years ago. Tyre technology has moved on at a dramatic pace. There are a number of changes in design and casing construction, but far the most important has been in compound and casing technology. Both have been deployed within the new Duravis R002 truck tyres. However, in addition to optimise the fuel efficiency, BCB in steer, drive and trailer, the new Duravis R002 product also delivers boosted wear performance and best in class for wet grip. In fact, this is the first tyre for regional application to receive an EU label grade A in a steer fitment for wet performance. The Juravis R002 is designed for regional on-road transportation customers, expecting the lowest cost per kilometre, reduced CO2 emissions, with the highest level of safety for all types of vehicles operating in a wide range of applications. Value natural resources. Bridgestone does not accept that resource consumption and environmental impact are inevitable outcomes of population growth and economic development. Rather, it must engage in a balance between business success and the use of Earth's resources. Therefore, reusing and recycling products is a key goal in reducing our demand on natural resources. Retreading premium tyres is one way in which worn tyre casings can be reused and recycled. This approach reduces the pressure on natural resources, but also prevents landfill or incineration of casings that can negatively impact on the environment in multiple ways. However, retread can only be successfully achieved with premium quality casings that are designed for a second or even third life. A typical heavy truck tire weighs around 70 kilograms and is made of steel, rubber and oil. A retread will typically use under 20 kilograms of rubber and oil and reuses the other 50 kilograms of material. Therefore, every time a retread is used, it reduces the need for 50 kilograms of raw materials to be used. Far less energy used in the production process and 50 kilograms less going into the transport industry's waste stream. In, ad in addition, the generally lower weight of quality retreads than new helps reduce overall rolling resistance. And from this comes potentially lower emissions and fuel bills. This is an important integral part of our approach of the premium tire producers. Finally, harmony with nature. Tire demand is expected to increase in conjunction with global population growth and the advancement of motorisation in developing nations. Today, 
approximately 90% of all natural rubber is harvested from the Havea rubber tree, which is primarily grown in tropical regions of South East Asia. Natural rubber is the primary raw material used to produce truck tyres worldwide and is consumed in large quantities. Therefore, a replacement is essential as the demand is adversely impacting negatively on our global ecosystem. The balance and harmony with nature is being stretched to unsustainable limits. With this in mind, Bridgestone has invested heavily in R&D to find a better solution to natural rubber from Havea trees and has succeeded in extracting latex from a shrub. Bridgestone Goyal is an evergreen shrub that originates in the arid zone from the southwestern part of the USA to northern Mexico and therefore can be grown in environments totally different from those suited for para rubber trees found within the equator countries. Also, the rubber constituent is very similar to that of para rubber trees. Given these factors, Gaia is expected to become the new source of natural rubber for truck tires. Bridgestone has been conducted integrated R&D activities from cultivation technology, natural rubber extraction process to application in tires. In 2015, Bridgestone produced the first tire made from Gaia oil derived natural rubber. This was an impressive step towards expansion and diversification of renewable resources. And Bridgestone continues to push this technology forward. So relieving the pressure on third world countries that need to grow food rather than natural rubber. It's all about being in harmony with nature. As you've seen, Bridgestone's technology adoption and investment in R&D have supported every improving environmentally friendly tyre products that not only benefit the environment, but also deliver significant benefits to our customers. Bridgestone also recognised the best tyre is not the entire solution. Therefore, Bridgestone is also developing many additional technologies that support the modern transport company. Data and internet-based technologies, load, mod mod load monitoring, damage models, etc., are arriving now and can support a forward-looking business into greater efficiency and lower environmental impact. In summary, customers that use our products benefit from reduced CO2 emissions, lowest cost per kilometre within a total tyre life package, enhanced safety, and more importantly, a product, both new and retread, that will reduce a fleet's carbon footprint, but will also impact less on the environment as reuse, recycle, and being in harmony with nature becomes our customer's goal as well, as we work together to, towards a brighter, and healthier future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Gary. That's very, very interesting. We've got a new word from my lexicon, Guayul. I'll have to try and remember how to pronounce that. Uh, that's great. Would you mind unsharing your screen, please, before we can move on to the next speaker? That would be marvellous. Thank you. I should have said at the outset, um, there is a Q&A function for anybody listening in. Uh, please feel free to submit questions throughout the presentations and uh, we'll do a Q&A at the end to all of our panel. But in the meantime, thank you very much indeed, Gary. Um, we're going to now move on to talk about um, refrigeration and the options to reduce the amount of diesel burnt in refrigeration units, which is quite timely because um, I understand that the government is about to end the discount on so-called red diesel, um, which can be used in non-road machinery. Um, so I think everyone's going to be focusing a lot on how to cut down their red diesel consumption and uh, Hultsteins is a very interesting technology and we're going to hear all about it now from Graham Usher who's a Managing Director of Eco Truck Refrigeration which is the UK agent for Hultsteins. Uh, please take it away Graham. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon everyone. As Steve says my name is Graham Usher. I work for a company called Eco Truck Refrigeration. 
and I work in harmony with uh, Holstings as a sales agent, a distrib distributor. So we're going to touch on today diesel-free refrigeration. So what are we going to discuss? We're just going to go a little bit into diesel, current diesel refrigeration systems, and then we're going to touch a bit more into the company, the products we have uh, as we move forward. So if we currently look where we are with diesel engines fitted into fridges currently, they're around about 25 to 25, 20 to 25 percent efficient. Coupled with this, when you look at a Euro 6 diesel engine, they're currently around about 43 to 45 percent. And there's a massive difference there, and you can obviously see why the amount of millions that's been pumped into modern truck engines in comparison to uh, diesel uh, engines within fridge units. We know that diesel engines are noisy. There's been some movement towards uh, reducing the noise, and I think all, all of them uh, can give you a package at the premium cost to reduce noise. I think it's fair to say maintenance-wise with a diesel engine, we know that it costs quite a lot to maintain, and that uh, cost will increase with age, as obviously the cost increases with age, the reliability of the diesel fridge will reduce the very nature of uh, parts wear out. But if we really look at uh, more closely about the particulates and emissions, this is what I want to touch on. When you look at uh, modern diesel, or most diesel engines now, um, I can't quite see some of these slides, but with regards to the emissions, as we know, diesel particulates and NOx are the real nasty ones that are attributed to lots of house issue, health issues, as well as you know, carcinogenic. So obviously there's been huge strides within the Euro 6 engine to, to reduce these and they've done a fantastic job in doing so. But there's been virtually nothing happening within the, the diesel engine within the fridge. So, I mean, what we've done is I, I saw, saw a report that was done by the Low Carbon Vehicle Partnership, which was done in 2019, when they actually married up a tractor unit and a trailer, uh, a Euro 6 tractor unit and a trailer, and then they measured the emissions from it. And when it was coupled to the trailer running along, it emits 200 times more fine particle diesel particulate matter. That's the one that gets really deep down inside the lungs, I understand, in comparison to a standard Euro 6 running on its own. And again, the NOx emissions were over 400% extra. So you can see these engines are not particularly clean. And what we're trying to do is to take these out and put something in its place that is clean, but only not clean, but can save you money. We also know that one litre of diesel emits 2.65 kilograms of carbon. As Steve said, we've got the biggest change within the industry happening in just over 18 months time on that 1st of April 2022. That duty, the duty as it sits now, it sits at 11 pence per litre in red diesel. That's shooting up to 58 pence a litre which is the same as white diesel. So you're gonna see costs increase of users of red diesel by near 100%. So what can we do to mitigate that? We've got some answers, what we feel a bit later on. So Holsteins, Holsteins is not a new business, maybe new to the UK, but certainly not a new business. The company was formed 76 years ago by Philip Holstein. And the key things as I see it, they've been in hydraulic manufacturing of refrigeration units for coming up 58 years this year. Certainly they were probably the first adopter of this technology in Europe. Certainly early adopters as well of the electronic control system as standard, which was some 41 years ago. I'd like to draw your attention to 1990. They launched a slimline fridge unit, which I think is a fantastic piece of equipment, uh, which we'll touch more on a bit later. Multi-temp 2005, Intellistart, which is a great uh, piece of efficiency that's fitted onto the fridge which enables the truck engine to start and stop on its own. So you don't need this other replacement diesel engine. And that's been more well tried and tested across the whole of the Nordics for a number of years. So 2014, Philip sold his business to Roger Holbeck. There's about eight or nine businesses in the, in the group. Roger's background is automotive, spending a good many years in very senior roles within AB car and truck in Sweden. Uh, and then 2017, we launched Holsteins UK. And that was when we, or Holsteins, purchased a company called Cold Connect, which was owned by Steve Mayle. Steve Mayle is the inventor of Ecogen, which we'll touch on a bit later. So what are we trying to achieve? If we look onto the left, currently this is what's happening. We've got two engine technology. We've got a dirty diesel engine uh, that's emitting uh, a lot of uh, emissions into the atmosphere. And we've got a generally speaking, a nice clean truck engine 
And what we're trying to do is use that nice clean truck engine to be able to power the fridge unit. So the products we have to be able to do that is the hydraulic drive fridges. And I'll go across now the three types of fridges we have. We term them top line, slim line, low line. The top line is the standard nose mount type diesel or um, fridge unit that you would see. Now, obviously ours is a lot smaller because you haven't got a diesel engine in it. We've got a standard undermount unit, which uh, again is quite popular. But the one that I'd like to talk to you about a bit more about is the slim line unit. So this is a slim light unit, so designed in the 1990s to keep body heights low. I understand asking the question is that apparently there's lots of areas within the Nordic countries where uh, low height into underground areas for delivery is quite common. So they need to design a fridge unit that had full capacity, be able to get the overall height of the body down, get it away from the elements and give it a long working life. And I think what's fair to say is that I've been around the industry for a lot of years now. And there's been numerous times when we've designed the interior height of bodies based around the cab swing of the truck with the nose mount diesel unit you fitted on it, which is crazy when you think of it really, because you're, you're then cooling more air than you need, and then you're pushing more air through the air than you need to. So if you can actually get that balance right, and every 100 mil of height reduction equates to 1% fuel saving. So getting the fridge fitted behind the cab, it's nice and tidy, you get the aerodynamics right, and there's some really good savings to be enjoyed. Putting it there gets it out of the way of all the elements, so you get a good long working life, which can be a challenge with undermounts by the very nature. They are quite popular now from the very, because you, you don't need to work at height and you can get the airstream, um, the aerodynamics right. But certainly there is a problem now on longevity. This does away with that by, actually fitting it behind the cab, it's really well protected. No working at height and easy to maintain. As I said, we've got the other two units that we operate. All of our units come in various configurations to suit single temperature, longitudinal lanes and multi-temperature. So what's the features I see of a hydraulic drive fridge? Well, the big one for me is that you get 100% cooling uh, when the truck is on idle. So it's a fantastic piece of equipment for uh, urban distribution and multi-drop. Uh, we all know that congestion is quite bad in, in our inner cities and only set to get worse, but this gives you full power at, uh, at tick over. Fuel saving, around about 85%, depending on the operation. One of the big savings, 95% reduction in emissions, and that's the nasty emissions that diesel particulates and NOx. Constant temperature, we've touched on with the Telestar, which enables you to set the fridge, uh, lock the car, lock, lock the truck up, and, and that will then cool the load so you don't need the other diesel engine there. Obviously that maintains the clean air using the Euro 6 engine. Reliability wise, over the years, Holsteins have honed the parts that are required for this. So they've actually built a beautiful bit of equipment that's very, very low in maintenance. It's universally compatible. It fits to any truck with a power takeoff from seven and a half ton to 26 ton. And noise, from a point of view of noise, there is, very little noise to go with it, so it's ideal for nighttime deliveries. One of the other things that I haven't seen before, which I think is a great idea when you're looking at heating the body, were in the Nordic countries, they fit a second, secondary piping system within the fridge and they tap into the engine coolant system. So they're taking that hot water, running it through the system and across the fans to be able to warm the air up. Well, what's the benefit of that? One is you're using a byproduct from the engine, you're not using the compressor, therefore you're saving money and energy. So you're doing it almost next to nothing. As we move on to the EcoGen, you may have seen this product uh, that Steve designed a few years ago now. Um, what is it? It's a hydraulic drive that generates electricity to run fridge units on electric. We have a couple of variants that I'll go into in more detail. So the first one, how does it work? We take a power takeoff from the engine, we put it through a permanent magnet generator, uh, generator that rotates at 1500 RPM. And that actually supplies 400 volt or 50 Hertz, exactly the same electricity as you would get from your mains. When Steve first designed this, it was really to power anything. So it doesn't discriminate, it will run carrier, Thermaking, Mitsubishi, anything where it needs 400 volts at 50 Hertz, we can supply it. We supply this unit in 20 kVA, which will fit to any rigid unit and power any single temp or multi-temp rigid. 30 kVA, which will power any multi-temp 
single temp trailer unit, or if you want to go to the heavy duty operations, we've got up to 50 kVA. The width of this unit is very slim, it's only 42 centimeters. So as long as it's got a PTO fitted, we're good to go. And then we can move on to the EcoGen Slimline. Now this is a unique product currently. It was designed by Steve to be able to fit to six per two tractor units. When there is no space between the axles, what we've done is that we've designed a unit that straps to the back of the cab. Now it doesn't have to be a six per two. It works perfectly well with LNG and CNG. And I've got a photograph of one uh, a bit later on in the presentation. So this is the 30 kVA generator, works in exactly the same fashion, uh, generating 400 volts at 50 hertz. These are the four photographs of this lot that we can have a quick conversation on. On the top left is an interesting one. This is an EG30 that's powering, we've got a few of these drawbar combinations knocking around the Nordics. Uh, the, the customer had this 10 year old trailer that he was going to dispose of because the, the, the diesel unit was getting a little bit unreliable and costly. So we looked at, and we did a, uh, a fitted an EG unit to them. Uh, I think it's a carrier Super 950 and a carrier Vector. So the good thing is that they didn't have to sell the trailer. They're keeping it going for another two or three years because it's working beautifully. And secondly, it's saving them between eight and nine litres of diesel an hour. Uh, and obviously I think they use white diesel over in the Nordic. So there's some really good savings to be had and it's extended the life of the trailer. It's a real win-win. The top right hand picture is a DAF. We've got a number of these knocking around in mainland Europe where they're actually running containers. Uh, so what they're doing, instead of having a container trailer with a donkey diesel engine on, we're actually running two reefer units or a 40 foot reefer unit using this tract unit. So one tractor, no matter what, then when they turn up at the docks, they can accommodate the customer's requirements, be it dry, dry, dry freight or multi-temperature. The bottom left-hand corner is a unique product we've got. It's fitted to the new S-Way Iveco. Um, and again, it, this is uh, unique in that it hasn't, doesn't run off a PTO. We've managed to work with Iveco and we've got an alternative power source to generate the power we need to turn over the alternator. So that is truly a diesel-free operation. And we've got a number of those units uh, with a supermarket in Holland and we've got the first few going into a supermarket in the UK in the next couple of weeks. On the right hand side bottom you can see that there's the orange cable. This is a EcoGem fitted to a Scania 6x2 R500 uh, and the orange cable is the cable we plug directly into the fridge, five pin fridge, uh, five pin plug of the fridge. Uh, it's uh, an arctic cable so it, it doesn't wear out um, uh, and we've actually tried to build it as strong as we possibly can. But from a health and safety perspective, we've got everything covered with regards to making sure that no matter what happens, uh, the operator's protected from the elect any electrical shock. So what's new? What can we look forward to 2021? We're, we're, we're in the midst of designing a slimline fridge to suit specifically for electric fridges and that will be a multi-temp operation so that will be coming end of the first quarter 2021. We've also got a lithium battery pack um, which will look to bolt onto, this will be a secondary bolt on almost that you can have the trailer and then you could almost rent or buy these modular construction batteries and what will happen is that you can bolt it onto your trailer and it can be charged from the EcoGen. So there's a surplus, surplus amount of electricity from EcoGen and that will feed directly into the batteries. We all know that lithium batteries are expensive, uh, but and this is possible and we're going to be putting it together for next year. So just to start to sum up, existing diesel engines have got very high pollution levels. They emit quite a lot of carbon. We know that they're inefficient, they're noisy, expensive to maintain. So, but we've got an option now. We can move directly onto a hydraulic drive fridge for rigids and it works. Bit of a challenge we've got with trailer refrigeration units purely and simply that I don't think we're ready to move away from diesel engines for a good many years yet. Uh, the cost to change and the infrastructure that's required for batteries I don't think I don't believe is going to be cost beneficial for a good few years so we're stuck with it. So what can operators do that are running diesel trailers? Firstly they can fit an eco gen which means that when the truck's on the road it can be using electric power on the savings that go with it. So why choose the hydraulic drive fridge? We've touched on it, 100% calling it idle. It's certainly the lowest emissions of any fridge on the market. It can be a direct replacement for diesel engines now with our Intellistar. 
very low noise levels. Probably the co lowest cost of operation of any fridge unit that I've come across to date. Um, so I'm so excited about that. And there's not only is it good for the environment, it's good for the pocket. It can fit any, any truck from seven and a half tons upwards. And it fits to, as I said, it's any truck that's got a PTO, it works with. There we go. All I would do is, is to encourage operators, if you are buying the equipment now, please consider fitting a PTO. And while you may not need it now, we know that there's some big price rises coming down the pipe 18 months away. And having that PTO will give you the benefit of actually retrofitting the EcoGen uh, or anything like it in the future to be able to enjoy those savings that go with it. So that's me done. So thank you very much. If you've got any questions, my, my contact details are there and uh, I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Steve. Cheers. Thank you very much indeed, Graham. Very interesting. As I said before, we'll uh, come to a Q&A at the end. Uh, I've got quite a few questions based on that for you, Graham, so be, be prepared. Um, but we're going to move swiftly on. Um, as I said to before, there is a Q&A facility for any delegates who want to ask questions and I'll be putting them to the panel at the end. Um, we're now going to move on to Adrian Barrett, who's the director of Rotec, the, uh, the Tachograph experts. Um, he's been in the industry 30 years as well. You all look so young, I can't believe any of you guys have been around 30 years. Must, you must have joined straight from France. <laughs> um, it, it astonished me last year that there's a huge pull for pull forward of uh, people buying new vehicles to avoid having smart tachographs which are the latest generation of digital tachographs which astonished me but obviously there's a big fear factor out there which is why I'm very pleased that you can join us Adrian to um, explain what is a smart tachograph and why are people so scared of it? I think Adrian's on mute. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I apologize again. I think I'm fine. Uh, so yeah, Adrian, but I work Sorry? You can hear you now, mate. I'm oh, sorry, beg your pardon. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, my name's Adrian Barrett. I've worked for Roadtech for 31 years. Uh, basically, we have a system where we uh, are uh, integrated products of Tackermaster, Falcon Roadrunner, Checkmaster, and Pre-Drive. Um, but basically, come and see us. Uh, we're in Hall 2, so come and see us on the stand in Hall 2. Gen 2 Tacos, uh, Generation 2 Tacos. Um, basically, the Smart Taco, or Gen 2 as it's known, Annex 1C, you'll probably hear various things called, uh, were introduced basically last year. So the Smart Taco was introduced of, as of June the 15th, 2019. So any newly registered or newly equipped vehicles over three and a half metric tons, are the, the use for commercial purposes are now fitted with a new generation Taco Raft. So basically if you've got a vehicle or, or you wanted to um, upgrade your vehicle, you have no option, you can't go back to the old style Taco Graphs, certainly can't go analog, I mean that's been a long time since we haven't been able to do that, um, but basically it means that you then have to have uh, the new style. The purpose of the new EE regulation 165-2014 uh, is to further improve road safety guarantee competition on the European domestic market and prevent the manipulation of digital Taco Graphs, whatever that really means. I mean, they've always talked about the manipulation of Taco Graphs, but uh, as soon as we move one step forward, Obviously, the, uh, the, the the crooks move one step forward as well. So it's uh, it's a bit like having guns in places, isn't it? The more guns you have, the the more people who want want to have guns to to do so. Um, what does it look like? So the new tachographs look very similar in some respects to the old ones. Uh, the smart taco Gen Two Annex One C, if that's the different names for it. Uh, you'll see on the top left hand side is the VDO style. The bottom right hand side is the Stone Ridge SE5000. There are other manufacturers that make it, but in the UK, we only generally tend to see these two manufacturers. Uh, VDO's brand, they used to, the, 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 where they put the cards in has slightly changed. And um, this card slot used to be where it used to accept the card and used to pull the card in like a cash point. Nowadays, it's slightly different and it's changed and it's got like a pop out window, uh, pop out drawer, sorry, not window, pop out drawer. Uh, as as the Stone Ridge has over the years as well. Um, 
So basically, what is different from a driver's perspective? So new driver smart cards. The, basically, a driver card is exactly the same for digital tachographs uh, for the Gen 2s as an old card, except the fact that it's got that G2 in the corner there. So in the bottom left-hand corner of the card there, you can see G2. So that just means that's a Gen 2 taco. But don't worry about that. That doesn't mean there's an issue with Gen 2, uh, Gen 1 cards. Gen 1 cards will still continue to operate, so you don't need to change those. So even if you've, uh, if you've had some drivers uh, you, you know, upgrading to Gen 2s uh, because their cards expired, don't worry about that, that's not a problem. We'll talk a bit more about that in, in a minute. Uh, company cards the same. So a company card will, is exactly the same. There are new star company cards. And again, if you have the new star company card, it will say G2 at the bottom. Um, in the last year since they were absolutely actually introduced, there has been an issue with company cards. I'll talk about that a little bit towards the end. Uh, just so that we've got a, an idea of, uh, of what we may be able to look out for uh, for any issues you've got. Uh, but the G2 in the corner, if you are able to upgrade the G2, you'll also, uh, just one thing you will also notice is that the serial number of your card um, has got a, a letter in it and the serial number is slightly different. Um, so you can see that on option 5B on that company card, it's got AZ, 8Z2 at the end. That's just due to the, the, the release. But G2, if it's a Gen 2, it'll have G2 on it and that's much clearer. So the new cards. So new driver cards and driver and company smart cards that have been issued by the DVLA from early 2019 are fully compatible and collect all the new fields of data required. I'll talk again what that, those new fields are, but it's not really that much difference. The current driver cards will be replaced as they come up for renewal and eventually the existing driver cards will be phased out. So basically the driver card does not need to be changed. A driver does not need to upgrade their card in order to use a Gen 2 TACO. Um, the new driver smart cards will be compatible with older generations of tachograph devices, but it'll only store the data in the old way. And the older generation uh, driver cards will work with the new smart taco devices. So you can put an old generation taco card into the Gen 2 taco and it'll work absolutely fine. No issues whatsoever, but it will only store the data in the old way because that's what the old card only can do. However, if you want to take advantage of the latest smart TACO features and technology on offer, then you'll need to, the new style driver smart card uh, to collect the data. There isn't that much, I really, there isn't that, a great deal to, to worry about. It's to do with positionings and stuff like that. But again, we'll talk more about that um, as, we, as we move on. So just to, uh, five main points here. So we've got from the 15th of June, we saw the mandatory introduction of the smart cards. This is one of the most significant changes in the tachograph regulations in more than, well, 13 years now, isn't it? Um, so basically, since, since we had the uh, introduction of the tachograph, uh, digital tachographs in 2006, really, that was the main, last major change. There were some rule changes which followed afterwards, which is why we said 12. The smart taco will attempt to eliminate the most severe forms of tampering and reduce driver infringements. It's got extra sensors, there's extra sensors on the vehicle, not something that necessarily is going to make much difference to the operators. Uh, plus, uh, the, the idea is to decrease roadside checks and lessen the administration burdens for transport industries. Again, that's again something that's going to be in the future, and this is the future that what these Gen 2 tacos will be able to provide us in the future. The new Smart Taco has a GNSS or Global Navigation Satellite System uh, um, aerial, so it basically will record the, the starting location that, uh, after three hours of continuous driving time and the end location will be recorded on the, the driver card so that you can see those. You'll see, we'll talk about this later on, but the driver has to agree to have all this information you know, recorded and, and stored on the vehicle. Um, but basically what the idea of this is that the driver, instead of actually having to put their start and finish place in, it will automatically do it from the um, GNSS. However, it needs to be a Gen 2 taco and it needs to be with a new style card. It can't be the old style taco with a new card or a, an old card on the new taco. So just be aware that that only affects the new styles. A new driver smart cards will be compatible with the older generation of tachograph devices. Older generation driver cards will work with the smart taco devices. However, you just won't be able to use the latest features as we've talked about. Uh, and then data can be wirelessly, and this is the idea, it can be wirelessly um, connected from the vehicle. Um, uh, the, the, this is one of the myths of the, of the new TACO devices, is that the, um, it, it, the idea is to reduce the amount of uh, stops that a, a, a vehicle could, or a driver or a vehicle or a company could have at the side of the road, uh, because the idea being um, 
it's the idea is that it will detect the issues but what people are thinking is that there could be a problem with regards to um what is actually stored uh, collected from the vehicle and i will talk about what that technology is and that technology is dslc it's a dedicated short range communication device so what this will allow is the law enforcement agencies to drive alongside the vehicle or as it drives past be able to connect to the vehicle and find out certain information however that information is extremely limited and extremely privileged and it's only certain information that is available so you get the latest security breach attempt the longest power supply interruption any sensor faults because there's more sensors on the new units many motion data errors the vehicle motion conflict so basically if there's a motion and there's nothing being recorded or vice versa and so the, the what is what is actually being recorded and what is actually happening to the vehicle will be slightly different Driving without a valid card, that makes sense. So, so if the driver is driving down the road with a vehicle um, and the card is not in place, it will say there's no card in there. So that's good. That's a good thing, isn't it? That we want to stop that driver. Was the card inserted while driving? So if a card insertion is occurred while driving, that will be shown. Any time adjustment data? So if the times have been changed on the units, um, that may be a bit dodgy. I mean, obviously, sometimes you've got time adjustments because it has to be done in calibration because it's wrong because TACO clocks aren't the greatest, as we're probably aware. Any calibration data, so including the dates of the last two stored calibration records, the vehicle registration number, so does it match the TACO, does the TACO registration number match the um, outside or displayed registration number, speed recorded by the TACO, but no data to identify the drivers will be transmitted. So in other words, uh, you wouldn't be able to drive, uh, get, you know, anybody who's got something, you know, a, a little bit of DSRC, um, communication device couldn't log into the vehicle find out that driver's name pull the side of those oh your driver blah 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 etc so the idea being so make sure your drivers are aware that the driver details will not be shown the only way the driver's details will be shown is if that driver um, is stopped in the normal way by the law enforcement agency the dvsa or the police would stop them in the normal standard way so workshop preparation um Basically, for the workshop to prepare, telegraph, telegraph, telegraph calibration workshops must prepare for the introduction of smart tacos. They should have done this by now. So most places that will be doing Gen 2 tacos are surely going to be up and ready for this. But they must make sure that they are able to do things like accurate testing of the DSLC module, as well as the GNSS, Global Navigator and Satellite System. By the way, GNSS is a group of satellites where we have GPS. GPS is one part of GNSS. So GNSS uses Eagle tracks and, and the Galileos and all the different star, the European satellites, as well as the American GPS that we use generally for tracking. Law enforcement. So we've talked about the fact that the law enforcement, that the DVSA will be able to stop the go by the side of the vehicle and get these DSRC. But there is no, it is not anticipated that this will happen in the near future. When I recently spoke to the DVSA about it, they reckon it was unlikely to happen in the next five years. And if they were to be honest, they thought it was unlikely to happen in the next 10. But it, it is one of those things that will be available to them. And it may be that, I mean, I imagine COVID probably brought things back. They also introduced it earned recognition relatively recently, and they're kind of bringing that in. So things have taken a back seat, but COVID has obviously also stopped that. So it's probably going to be even longer away before we actually get such a thing. A few things that we just need to be aware of. Let your drivers know. Make sure your drivers are aware of the changes, but they do not need to replace their existing cards before they, unless they expire or become damaged or are lost. So do, under the normal circumstances, if they to replace a card, will not change. The driver will actually not notice much change. That's the thing they need to know about. The drivers will need to answer two questions regarding the GDPR data usage. When they first using their Gen 2 cards, it will ask them, do they want to publish ITS data or video? They say yes or no. That can be changed if they decide against that. The ITS is just like data birth and stuff like that. Video data is slightly more technical data. Um, if you want to discuss that or talk more about that later on, we possibly can in the Q&A, but uh, you can probably find it online and the video manual does explain it quite well as well. And so does the Stonehenge. Company card issues in some cases, and this is really important and it is worth bearing in mind for everybody. Uh, older company cards do not work with Gen 2 units. Um, if you, uh, in some cases is the case, if you've used a Gen 2 card in a unit and then you try to use a Gen 1 card, we find that that might not work. But we've also had issues, certainly with some of the Stone Ridge uh, issues where Gen 2 cards are required. We actually had our cards replaced at Road Tech because we were having issues with Stone Ridge. And so basically, this is going back a while now, but, um, but basically just be, bear in mind, it might be worth, but they will upgrade 
and it is worth going through the upgrade process because they will upgrade for free. Um, if you're very close to your cards expiring, you might be a bit of a gray area there because they won't be longer. They, the cards won't be any longer than the five years you've already currently got. So there you go. That's basically uh, the Gen 2 tacos. I I'm sure most of you, or a lot of you who are watching, uh, will have seen, maybe even have some, but some of you will probably be getting these in the future. Um, we'll just, you can discuss more about it later on if you want in the Q&A. Uh, come and see us in Exhibition Hall too. We've also got, you know, we can show you the dot units and stuff that we've done, which will download the, 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 uh, the data from the Gen 2 vehicles and Gen 1s, and also give you data uh, things like, you know, is the driver driving without a card and he'll get notifications. So we can do all that for you. Come and see us in Exhibition Hall too. Um, I think that's just about it. I've talked for a quarter of an hour non-stop. So there you go. Lovely to see you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Adrian. Spot on, quarter two, absolutely perfect timing. Would you mind unsharing your screen, please, so we can move on? Thank you very much indeed. Superb. Right, we're now going to move on to uh, Sean Whitaker, who um, is from Chevron. Another long-serving gentleman, 25 years in heavy-duty lubricants, so uh, another expert in his field. Um, I often think that oils, as a bit of a sort of uh, motorbike enthusiast, you know, I, I like to change my engine oil quite frequently, though uh, I'm told these days that modern synthetic oils don't need changing, but, you know, that's just me. I like to change my oil every year, whether it needs it or not. But I'm sure Sean's going to tell us when it comes to uh, heavy-duty trucks, uh, lubricants, uh, a lot more high tech than they used to be and um, extended oil drain intervals are, are no longer that, that, that worrisome. So uh, yeah, Sean, please uh, tell us all about the latest in lubricant technology. Thank you. He's muted. All right, there you go. Got Thank you. I, I didn't have the capability to do that on my own. No, it's okay. <laughs> so um, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're dialing in from. And, and thanks for this opportunity. Um, as you said, my name is Sean Whitaker. I'm part of Chevron Lubricants and I do product development for heavy duty motor oils, which we market under the Dello brand um, globally. Um, it's, it's been interesting to see in this session where we're all looking at future technologies that a majority of us are looking at it from the angle of reduced emissions and improved efficiency. And I'm here to talk to you about how lubricating oils or heavy duty motor oils uh, fit into that equation. Those of us who have been involved in the trucking industry over the past 15 to 20 years are very familiar with the fact that um, Emission regulations have become significantly tighter over that period of time. And they've driven the need for advanced systems for emission control. And that's been largely for reductions of things like nitrogen oxides and particulate matter, but other uh, criteria of pollutants like hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide. And depending on where that they're implemented and sort of the, the vintage of the engine, We've, we've sort of converged on a collection of technologies which are usually based in three main uh, focuses. One being exhaust gas recirculation, which reduces the amount of NOx coming out of the engine itself. Selective catalytic reduction, which uh, provides a NOx reduction through a, a reducing agent called AdBlue. And finally, a diesel particulate filter, which is a very effective device at reducing smoke emissions from uh, diesel engines. But all this comes at a cost. It's not only just the upfront cost of these uh, relatively expensive devices, but also ongoing costs for the end user in the form of maintenance and operational costs like cleaning these devices, as well as a fuel economy penalty. Uh, we've performed a survey earlier this year in the UK where we talked up almost 100 fleets and talked to them about any problems or their experience with operating devices with these uh, types of technologies. And nearly two thirds of them have experienced problems with their, their Euro 6 vehicles that were focused on after treatment systems. Um, many have complained about uh, DPF filters that have become blocked requiring uh, either them to be taken out of service or some sort of maintenance to um, rectify that situation. 
Um, about 46 percent of them have actually had to take their uh, unit out of service to be what's called manually regenerated. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means here in a minute. I want to for, the, for those of you that, that may not be as familiar with the way these um, devices operate, I'll talk a little bit about um, one of the very effective emission control devices called the diesel particulate filter. Um, th these are up to 99% effective in reducing particulate matter emissions and they're relatively simple in, in the concept. It's a, it's a flow through device which has a porous ceramic media that actually traps the particulate as it flows out of the engine and through this device. If the temperature conditions are uh, suitable, that, that particulate matter burns instantaneously. When that's not the case, it accumulates on the device until which time the electronics on the engine command what is called a regeneration. Now, this is a, an event in which the temperature of the exhaust is raised, oftentimes through the use of supplemental fuel, either through a late post injection or maybe even an injector installed directly in the exhaust stream of the engine. In either case, the temperature is raised and that soot is burned off the pores of that media and is emitted out of the engine. One of the few downsides to the operation of these devices is that any incombustible material will tend to accumulate on the devices and raise the back pressure of the system and overall reduce its efficiency. We know that one of the primary sources of these incombustible materials is actually the inorganic part of the lubricating oil. It's the metallic uh, additive components that are used to increase the functionality of engine oils to enhance their performance in being a lubricant, but also to protect themselves from premature breakdown. Turns out that nearly 90% of what we call this ash or this incombustible material that collects in DPFs is actually sourced from the, from the engine oil. And that's in the form of things like calcium and magnesium, zinc and phosphorus, which are have for a hundred years been the mainstay of of lubricant additives. The other 10% comes from wear debris or things that are ingested from the air intake system, but like I said, 90% of it comes from the engine oil. And for that reason, back in around 2007, there were new standards put in place that put a cap on the amount of, of this ash that can be used in an engine oil. Um, it's a particular way that it's measured, but the, the traditional limit is a 1% ash technology and that you, you'll, you'll find the majority of modern lubricants um, contain every bit of that allowable level. And that's because that's really the, the functional part of the lubricant. If you look at the, the pie chart on the left, you can see the various sources of that ash as being the anti-wear componentry as well as what we call the detergent system, which is uh, typically calcium or magnesium based additives that contribute to that total ash. What we've done at Chevron with revolutionary new technology is taken about 60% of the, that incombustible material out of the oil and replaced mm -hmm. it with ashless componentry that provides the same or in many cases more potent function than the traditional additive technology. And what that allows is a totally re-optimized system, one that is deli delivering both protection for the engine, but as is very important today, protection for the emission control system. This allows for lower maintenance costs, in some cases, drain interval extension, and a very important attribute that we've learned more about here recently, which is fuel economy retention. We've proven these benefits in the field and what I'm showing here are say, bags of ash. And so what I didn't mention earlier is that in order to, to deal with the ash that accumulates in this, these systems, oftentimes the truck after a certain period of time, maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of a half million kilometers have to be taken out of service, the diesel particulate filter removed from the exhaust 
and a maintenance event performed such that you blow that material out. These bags here represent um, that incombustible material, that ash that's been blown out of these systems. On the left-hand side, you can see the amount of ash in, in a, from a unit that had been running with a traditional oil compared to one on the right that is using a, a lower ash oil. And you can see that visually there's a, a significant difference. And in fact, in our testing, we've shown that you can increase the interval between these ash cleanings by two and a half times by reducing the amount of ash in the oil by 60%. There's ancillary benefits to that ash reduction, however, and one of them is in the area of fuel economy retention. Fundamentally, we know that as this ash accumulates in the DPF, a couple things happen. One is that it can contribute to an increase in back pressure, which has an effect of reducing the efficiency of the engine. As that ash begins to take up more and more space in the device that would otherwise be available for reducing PM emissions, it also requires that these regeneration events happen more frequently and perhaps with longer duration. That also contributes to a fuel economy penalty. But when you keep the ash level low over the life of the system, you keep the back pressure low and you keep those regeneration events spaced out such that you in fact retain the fuel economy that was delivered when the engine and the vehicle were new. And what we've seen is that um, th this cumulative effect reduces the overall fuel consumption over the life of a system by upwards of 3%. It's kind of difficult in on the road engines to resolve that level of fuel economy improvement. And so we've conducted carefully orchestrated testing in a, a laboratory that using very realistic techniques to evaluate this performance. And here I'm showing what is called CT images or x-rays of a DPF after a certain um, ash loading. And as you can see, if you en envision the exhaust flow moving from top to bottom and the plug of ash that's clogging these devices is that more white portion um, visualized at the bottom half of the device here. And we've aged a couple of systems for the exact same loading time. And here again, like we saw in those bags of ash earlier, the, the actual clogging of these devices that you can see visually between the conventional oil used on the left and the ultra low ash 0.4% uh, product that was aged for the system on the right hand side. The engine actually sees these differences as well. And what we're showing here are graphs of the exhaust back pressure as a function of the ash loading. And that you can see that that baseline oil, which had tradition, you know, very similar to um, most oils on the market today, 1% ash, as that ash loading increased, and especially when you couple it with the particulate matter, which is being emitted from the engine continuously, that you, you get significant increases in back pressure, which can and will affect fuel economy performance. However, during that same exact loading period, the system that was aged with the ultra low ash oil exhibited almost no back pressure increase. And what we've seen is that that alone accounts for about 0.7% uh, of the fuel economy improvement. The other means by which a fuel economy is retained is through keeping the regeneration frequency sufficiently long or, or low. And in, in that same testing, we evaluated um, using what's called the World Harmonized Transient Cycle to evaluate the frequency of regenerations and the amount of fuel that is burned over that cycle throughout the course of that aging experiment. And here we're showing with the, the line in red that we saw a reduction in that uh, regeneration interval. So an, an actual increase in the frequency of about 70%. Whereas the system aged with a ultra low ash oil, what we're marketing as Delta 600 ADF, only about a 10% increase. And that's over this, the, you know, almost a full useful life aging experiment. Um, the combination of the back pressure 
uh, reduction and the regeneration frequency effects account for a combination of 3% improvement. And, and with fuel prices like they are and the fuel being the, the most the most significant operational expense for trucking fleets today, this is a real savings that has ancillary benefits for the environment. So in conclusion, I would just want to kind of reiterate the value proposition for these high technology lower ash oils. We didn't talk about it really in today's um, discussion, but uh, the, these advanced oils have the uh, benefit of extending maintenance intervals, even from the engine oil lifetime itself, but also from increasing the uh, interval between these DPF cleanings by two and a half times. And in, in many cases that can take it entirely out of the equation for a truck owner because it's, if standard intervals are somewhere around a half a million kilometers, you multiply that by two and a half times, that's well longer sometimes than the, the engine or the vehicle is even in service. Talked about the fuel economy retention benefit right to the truck owner's bottom line. And then it, we, we're keeping the unit in service. And that, that's also for in today's operating environments also uh, extremely critical that these trucks can stay in the road in revenue service. Um, so really great uh, improvements offered just by changing to a higher quality, lower ash engine oil. With that, I'll wrap up and I believe we're at the end of our session and ready to transition to the Q&A. That's fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, Sean. I never knew there was so much in the uh, golden liquids. Very, very interesting. Okay, yes, as Sean said, we now move on to the, uh, the Q&A. Um, so let me just put you on gallery view so I can see you all. Um, it's quite difficult to come up with a question put to the whole panel, but I have one at the end, um, which I'll save to the end. But I'm just going to run through a couple of very quick questions for each of you. Um, to start with you, Gary, low rolling resistance tyres. Um, traditionally, most operators I speak to, they say, yeah, they are good on fuel, but they only last half the mileage because they come out of the factory with only <laughs> half the tread. Is that still true or is modern technology enabling lower rolling resistance tires to do the same mileage these days as what we might call a conventional tire? Okay, uh, yep, yeah, I'm off mute. Uh, with regards to, you know, low rolling resistance tires, you are correct that they do have a reduced original tread depth, but the, the whole point is to make fuel savings and those fuel savings can offset the cost and also offset uh, the less mileage that you can achieve from these products. But I think what's really important with regards to low rolling resistance products is that, you know, one, you, you measure the fuel. That's really, really important. You've got to measure the fuel. Uh, another thing is with regards to driver training because, you know, the driver can impact quite heavily in terms of fuel efficiency. So if they're heavy on the pedal, then you can lose any sort of benefit from uh, rolling resistance. That means that uh, it's not only with regards to training, you also uh, need as well some kind of monitoring and rewards uh, system for drivers as well to encourage them uh, to drive in, in, a, in a positive fashion with regards to reduced uh, fuel efficiency. The other thing, Tire, tire pressure monitoring systems or pressure uh, husbandry, really key that you maintain good pressures because again, you know, if you fit uh, low, low, low rolling resistance tires and you're not maintaining your pressures, you lose the benefit. And then also having rolling resistance products on both the tractor and trailer as well, because, uh, you know, if you're only doing the tractor unit, you're only seeing 50% of the benefit. So, and then finally, and, and not so important, is with regards to generally, and I talk about generally, uh, those types of products are for sort of national or uh, continental work. However, uh, you know, if you're driver training, you're monitoring your driver, you know, you've got Ecopia all round, you're monitoring your, your tire pressures, and you're doing all that, these products can also work in what our market is uh, a regional application. And we are seeing fleets with regional uh, applications 
you know, moving to, you know, low rolling resistance Ecopia product, seeing the benefits, but it has to be a combined package. If you're just looking at mileage, you're not measuring your fuel and you're not doing the other things, then you're not going to see any benefits moving to a low rolling resistance product. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned uh, tyre pressure monitoring systems there, and I've seen, you know, most of the manufacturers now have got their own proprietary system. Um, when are we going to see a day when every, you know, tyre will come out the factory fitted with a universal style tyre pressure monitoring system? So if I'm not using the same brand of tyre on different axles, I'll be able to read the tyre pressures remotely, no matter which brand of tyre I'm using. Is that, am I talking pie in the sky there? Or is it ever going to happen? No, no, uh, it's, it's there with regards to intelligent tyres. I mean, uh, you will see, for example, our Giravis and Ecopia lineup, they, their RFID, radio frequency identification. That's very much the, you know, the first stage with regards to intelligent tyres. Uh, but we are, uh, as we speak, uh, looking at uh, sensors with inside tyres that not just measure temperature, uh, sorry, pressure, but also measure temperature. And they can also tell you, uh, you know, the mileage that they've completed in their life as well. Uh, and also they'll be able to tell you as well if they've received an impact that could have potentially damaged the tire. So those uh, systems um, are in development. Some have been released, uh, but we're on sort of like, a, you know, a sort of road pathway uh, to uh, the smart tyre and that that will be with us very 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 shortly as well so the intelligent tyre so it's just around the corner and of course these technologies uh, you know develop uh, very very quickly as well uh, so yeah look out for them they are coming okay we've had a, a question submitted to, for you Gary as it happens um, is it true that no um, 80 profile tyres are able to obtain uh, an A rating for fuel economy uh, 31580. Um, that's a very, very, that's a very, very good question. Just to say that within the UK market, 31580 is not a common size. Right. Um, you know, 31570 is a common size. Uh, with regards to 31580, you will see more often in uh, Ireland, that's a, a common size uh, for Ireland and mainland Europe. Uh, but our dominant size uh, is with regards to 31570. Uh, with regards to obviously you're looking at uh, you know, our Ecopia products with regards to that, I must admit off the top of my head, I can't uh, give you the answer to that, but uh, I can come back to you at a later date with regards to that. But of course, you know, as we develop our products, uh, you know, um, we're investing heavily in mixing equipment, heavily in high grade silicas as well. So, uh, you know, definitely we do have uh, A grade. I must admit, you know, when you're going to, you know, high aspect ratio tires, then of course the rolling circumference is greater. There's more mass within the construction. So that not, doesn't necessarily tend towards uh, an A grade. But uh, uh, if I can come back to you, I can give for you a yes or no. I just need to have a look at the data sheets for yeah, that. Uh, uh, we, can answer, we can answer this question Pick it up later. Uh, okay, yeah, I'll have a, I'll have a quick look. Individual. Fine. Okay, uh, I've got a question for you, Graham. Um, just when we're talking about refrigerated semi-trailers rather than rigids, do you have any figures on how long a typically, you know, a trailer will spend decoupled from the tractor unit these days if it's parked up, it's waiting to be loaded? Um, or do you find these days that tractors and trailers tend to spend a lot more time coupled up together? Asking questions of operators up and down the countries, it really does vary from one or two hours a day, Steve, up to five or six hours a day. Uh, but I would say that the average is one or two hours. I think operators now have got uh, uh, fewer trailers within the system as they become very lean. So they are utilizing them more. Okay. And uh, just following up from that, I mean, we're tending now to talk about moving towards more electric vehicles, especially rigid vehicles on urban distribution. Is that going to actually, in a funny sort of way, discourage the use of PTOs to power fridges? Because you you're not, don't want to run down your main batteries. And I was thinking exactly right. Yeah, your lithium ion. Yeah. Lithium it ion. Is. is that going to be a way of doing a shift with an electric truck 
whether the fridge can power itself for six hours? Yeah, I think we are. I mean, certainly from the initial test we've done, which is being done over in Sweden currently, that they're looking at how we can, in the past, when you look at traditional diesel engines, that with, with the engine generating anywhere between 8 and 14 kilowatts of energy, it's never really been a, a prerequisite to look at how much energy the fridge is actually using to, to re, you know, do the refrigeration. When we move on to electric trucks, what's obvious is we've got to do that as economically as we possibly can with as least amount of energy. So that's where we are. We started that process now to actually design specifically very low energy use fridges to work within uh, electric vehicles. Otherwise, they're just going to take too much out of the battery, Steve, aren't they? Yes. Uh, we had another question submitted. Um, regard to Intellistart, is it legal to leave an occupied vehicle with a main engine running? I understand it is, yes. I mean, it's, it's common across Europe. I mean, so, I mean, a DAF, Scania, Volvo, all have these options where we plug directly into the bodybuilder's loom to do it. Uh, and again, it's been widely used across the Nordic countries since 2008. Okay. Okay, thank you very much indeed. I'm moving on to Adrian now. We've got a couple of questions about the uh, these, this, this Gen 2 um Tacos. I mean, what is your feeling about why, as I say, there was a, you know, seems to be such a huge pull forward of new vehicles in the first half of last year. Do you think it's because operators are, how can I put this, I think their drivers are really widespread and uh, widespreadly filling their tachographs and they were concerned that these new units were going to stop that? Or was it just this worry about the DVSA being able to read their tachographs remotely. What do you think was the that fear factor? I don't understand it personally. Yeah, I think it's a very good question. I think I think the fear factor of the DSRC thing, so this bit they're going to be able to read, and as you, as you drive past it, you're going to be able to find out who's driving, whether they've done any you know, driver's hours infringements and all that stuff. Uh, there was. But if you remember back in 2006, there was a the massive... Um, you know, take up of, of vehicles that had analog tachographs in them because everyone was scared of the change. And I think that's the that's the, the issue is the scared people being scared of change. And so therefore, I, I think if they weren't so worried about the change, I think it wouldn't be such an issue. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's a bit of, uh, there's an element of two things: the change, the worry that there's people are going to get there, to, but and and then not it's misinformation as well. It's not actually finding out. You know, the, you know what it's like in this industry. Somebody says something, and it's all very much sort of a you know it's Chinese whispers, and 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 it starts off with a complete load of tosh to start with. So so I think that's the issue. So I, the answer is I I think it's hard to say what exactly the issue is, but generally I think it's change. Okay, and why do you think in the UK neither the police nor the DVSA are going to be using this remote technology? Is it just because the readers are just too expensive or do they not think it's worthwhile for an enforcement? And I would have, it sounds like a really powerful enforcement tool to me. Why I totally agree, I think it's a really good idea, finance? yeah. I think, it's, I think funding is the issue. I think funding was the main issue. When I've, I, there's a few people obviously I know at the DVSA that we deal with through earned recognition and stuff and we we talked to them about that and, and they said yeah funding is, is mainly the issue also because it's governmental you've got to go through a lot of a lot of ch you know changes in order to make that available and make it something that you can do so yeah I, th I think i think funding is the main criteria but also the fact that yeah they had earned recognition and lots of things have changed for them recently mm, okay that's great Right, Sean, I've got just one quick question for you. I think, you know, your, sort of your, tech, your presentation baffled me slightly with the technology. Um, but one thing I did notice in your slides is that post Euro 6, obviously all the truck manufacturers are now really heavily focused on carbon reduction from their engines. They've all got to meet, um, you know, the 25% re reduction. It's based on vector. We all know they're not the real world, but they are going to be looking for ways for their engines when they come out of the factory to be more fuel efficient. Does that mean that they're now putting pressure on you guys, instead of worrying about particulate emissions and DPFs, to come up with a super, super low viscosity engine oil, almost like water, which is pushed around the engine a lot more easily? And is that possible to do still with uh, extended drain intervals? Or are you going to end up with such a thin oil that you've got to drain it every 10,000 kilometers? Um, so, so I would tell you, it's, it's very much correct that um, kind of vehicle builders, engine builders are looking to the lubricant as part of the equation to meeting future standards, which are very focused on CO2 reduction and fuel economy improvement. One of the, the sort of obvious ways to do that, like you say, is to reduce the viscosity of the engine oil because that reduces the pumping drag within the engine and it enhances the, the truck's efficiency. Um, 
that's that's already in place in parts of the world, especially in the United States. Back in 2017, we introduced a new uh, low viscosity category. We're about to do the same in the European market with uh, upgrades to the ASEA standards. And it stands to reason that even when you look forward to 2024 and beyond when these regulations get tighter, that that becomes a more significant consideration. But you're right. I mean, you'd have to weigh that against the potential for durability concerns as well as long life. And so there really can't, um, can't be any compromise to the overall performance. And so we're kind of looking at looking at this holistically, the way we can bring together advancements in base oil technology, additive technology, and bring them together in ways that allow for that uh, efficiency improvement without any compromise to the performance or the longevity of the oil. I mean, I can remember when, you know, I first started messing around with bikes and cars, 1540 was considered fairly normal, now 530. Are we ever going to see an oil with a, you know, cold viscosity below five, or is that just technically impossible? Um, it, it's it's technically very possible. Um, I think it's still early days with respect to how we um, kind of manage around what the requirements of those future fluids are, because it really takes a combination approach. It's not just developing a thinner, thinner oil, but also kind of marrying that with engine technology that has been developed to accommodate it, right? So oftentimes these, these don't happen independently, but they're their collaborative efforts and it to kind of bring together the engine technology that allows for it as well as the lubricant technology that enables it. Yes. I mean, I've heard as well, you know, anecdotally that really regeneration is only a problem on urban operations where the vehicle is doing a lot of low start or low speed work where the, the engine temperature doesn't get high enough to burn off these particulates. Is this low ash oil only relevant to urban operations or would a long distance operator who perhaps doesn't suffer from... No, not, not really. I mean, you're right from the standpoint that depending on the duty cycle of the vehicle, that can dictate how much um, sort of active regeneration is necessary or how many of these sort of ancillary means. But, but no matter what, um, keeping the, the amount of those incombustible materials out of the exhaust keeps the, the back pressure that is exerted by the device low and that keeps the engine very happy and in, in its most efficient state and the longer you can do that the more the longer you retain that fuel economy improvement okay great okay i've got a final question which is applicable to all of you so you can take it in the order in which you do your presentations if you like um post covid a lot of people talk about a resetting the economy perhaps more focus on you know a green economy and you know we're going to do things differently in the future do you think when you're going out talking to customers next day from next year, after you know things have calmed down a little bit, is your job going to be easier talking to operators when you're talking about selling them new technology, which might cost a little more, but will save them money in the long run and is definitely better for the environment? Or are they still going to be in survival mode and they're going to be just go away and battening down the hatches? I'm just trying to get through 2021 and we'll talk about lower oil resistance tires or you know better oils or other things like that. Do you think your job's going to be easier or harder post-COVID? We'll start with you, Gary. What do you think? Um, I mean, the, the good news is things are getting easier with regards to vehicle telematics, because in the past, trying to measure, you know, how much fuel you've used, uh, also looking at driver behaviour and things, that, how that's influenced fuel efficiency, is getting easier so as more and more high-tech vehicles are hitting the market it's easier for the customers uh, to see exactly you know fuel benefits so i think it's going to be uh, easier for us in the long term as more and more fleets find it much easier to you know measure their fuel measure their drivers and see the benefits you know, with regards to, you know, the fuel savings, the CO2 reductions as well. Uh, and so I, I, think, I think things will improve for us um, because like I say, in the past, it's been very, very complex to try and show fleets fuel savings when they haven't got uh, all the telematics that we're seeing now in modern day vehicles. Mm -hmm. And just to say that I have found <laughs> with regards to our 31580 in uh, drive position is A-rated. 
So a 31580 uh, in a drive, in an Ocopia Highway Drive 002 is A rated for rolling resistance. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, Gary. Graham, do you think, I mean, obviously you've got the advantage of the red diesel exemption ending soon, so, we hope know, so. That, should, <laughs> that should be, but uh, yeah, I mean, obviously we, we, know, we know Hall is a conservative with a small C, they don't like anything new really. Do you think your job's going to get easier post-COVID or is it going to be even harder to convince people to spend more on their vehicles to save in the long run? I think it's going to be a game of two halves, to be honest. Um, I, I think certainly the first half of 2021 is going to be difficult. Uh, and then we're going to start to, to see the economy start to, to move forward again. Uh, certainly the conversations I'm having up and down the country with operators, large and small, they all know they have to change. It's just a matter of how they do it. So I'm, I'm very optimistic things are going to get easier, but it has to be on the basis that, you know, there's a cost saving there as well, you know. Uh, we all know that how uh, we said, uh, conservative they are in the UK with a small C. Operators, you know, don't have an easy time. There's not huge amounts of money in the system, certainly not now after what we've gone through. So, you know, every pound's a prisoner. So if we can show that we can save a few more pounds than, than it costs to, to, to make that, then we're on to, on to a winner, I think. But certainly from a, a point of view of emissions, that is certainly firmly on the agenda now that people are willing and hope and, uh, to discuss further. In Adrian, for your point of view, obviously Gen 2, if you buy a new truck, it's got to have a Gen 2 taco in it. From that point of view, you're not selling them things. But do you think the fear factor is gradually disappearing and people are understanding perhaps the benefits for these things rather than the downside? Yeah, definitely. I think people were a bit scared at the beginning because it was a bit hard. You know, people, it all came, um, it was fairly quickly brought on us as well so it's all like you took so we had to do some development to make it work but once 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 you downloaded one and you know how it works and it's exactly the same it's absolutely it's fine so yeah i mean it's not been a it's it, the take up hasn't been as high just for the fact that in the last six months obviously they just haven't sold as many vehicles and that's really you know so, so it's it's been restricted so much uh, i don't know if you're aware uh, steve did you see there was a question there from colin barnett regarding uh, i did oh, send a private answer just now it's on in the answer yes Shall I just read it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Is it going to be a UK? It says, are we ever likely to see UK aware tacos, i.e. not giving overspeed warnings for running between 56 and 60 miles per uh, 60 mph? And the answer to that, Colin, is that actually the, the uh, calibration of a vehicle is what the overspeed happens. So most vehicles are calibrated to 90 kph, um, which is just under, well, it's just underneath 56 kp, uh, miles per hour. And that's why we get the warnings 5660. So if the calibration could be higher, uh, I'm not entirely sure what 60 is. It's probably about 96 or something like that. And then that would be the difference. Uh, it is a calibration item. Thank you. Thanks for that, Adrian. Uh, and finally, you, you Sean, as, he, as I say, is it going to be easier to convince operators to uh, buy better oil or are they going to be buying the cheapest crap they can just to survive? Well, I mean, I, I guess my, my comment is that I have, I'm yet to encounter a market environment in which customers aren't interested in saving money. Um, uh, I'll kind of echo some of Gary's points earlier that when you're talking about fuel savings, it can be a challenge to measure it and, and maybe even isolate the source of the fuel economy savings. And so what we've seen with these kinds of technologies is it sometimes takes time to um, uh, have customers better understand the, the comprehensive nature in which you can enhance fuel economy. This, this isn't always an instantaneous savings. It's one that is sort of realized over the life of the system. But I think that once they become, you know, a little bit more um, accustomed to that uh, sort of environment that especially in post COVID or during the, the market conditions we're seeing now where revenues might be squeezed or you know it, it just a kind of a, a change in the marketplace that they're going to be really looking for ways to uh, help their bottom line mm. and just as a follow-up to that i mean who are your customers these days because an awful lot of operators have third-party repair and maintenance these days and do they care what engine oil goes in and when the dealer services it or do they just rely on the dealer so you're actually selling more to the the vmus and you are to the haulier these days well, it sort of runs the gamut around the world. I mean, you're, you're right. Some of those situations that it's not necessarily in, in the end user's hands, but uh, oftentimes we're selling to big fleets. They're, they're, they're very much in control of their purchase decisions and are looking for ways to, you know, maximize their um, bottom, you know, their savings and, and understand that uh, engine oil plays a big part of that. 
Fantastic. Well, I think that's going to draw it to a conclusion right there, gentlemen. Thank you so very much indeed for your time and your expertise. That was absolutely fascinating. So I really do appreciate you uh, taking part in this first ever virtual commercial motor conference. So thank you very much indeed for participating. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for organising. Thank you. Thanks, guys.